Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm David Lissondak, usually the guy behind the camera, and I just want to thank Robert and Werner and Heike who asked me to make a presentation today. It's more of an exploratory presentation. So we're gonna, we're gonna get a little more conceptual, and it's the idea that perhaps fascia in some ways acts as the connector in the connection between the mind and the body. I'm from Pittsburgh in the United States. That's where the city is, that's what it looks like. I work here at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So in my day job, I do structural integration, visceral manipulation, various different myofascial specialties, usually dealing with people mostly in chronic pain in one way or another, anywhere from nine months to nine years, sometimes even longer. The, the people that they don't know what to do with, they send to me. So uh, I have a lot of fun, it's always different. It's always fascinating trying to figure out what combination of approaches and techniques works uh, the best with what patient that I see. Uh, now we did a study in my department on meditation in low back pain and it was mindfulness meditation. So mindfulness meditation is more about generating inner awareness. There's no specific chance necessarily. Uh, the most simple form of mindfulness meditation to calm the mind and quiet the body is to breathe in and as you breathe in, say, as I breathe in, I know that I am breathing in. And then you exhale and say, as I breathe out, I know I am breathing out. That's a very simple form of mindfulness meditation. So it's the easiest kind of meditation to teach large numbers of people. So we did a study and uh, it was, whoops, <laughs> it's my hair. So, uh, thank you. Now I'm wired, thank you. So we did this study on meditation in low back pain and we found that there was perhaps good evidence that just simple med mindfulness meditation can help reduce the severity, the perception of the pain in low back pain. Uh, it wasn't the best study because we started off with 89 people in it, but by the time it was all done, we were only able, we were down to 12. So this is hardly a robust sampling uh, of patients. And I do wonder um, if part of the reason why these 12 people who made it through to the end all reported that they had an overall decrease in their perception of low back pain by doing the meditation is because we know that nitric oxide is something that causes fascia to relax. And there have also been studies done with monks in Tibet and uh, people who meditate 30, 40 years and they have abnormally higher concentrations of nitric oxide in their systems. So they're planning a, a second study on this and I've talked to the person doing the study and I'm hoping that maybe that could be looked at but I, I don't think the funding is necessarily going to be there to take that study to the next level but I think that's potentially fertile ground. But most mind-body medicine type situations are top-down. It's about how do we use the mind to affect the body. Now, I'm a body worker. It's what I do. It's what I love. And I'm interested about the other way, how the body can change the brain. And I have a couple of quick examples. Uh, how many people here do manual therapy? Okay, great, great. So I'm sure you've all had an experience where your work has triggered something that was more than just physical. Okay, and I see quite a few of you nodding. Okay, and it's a spectrum, and it fascinates me. Uh, it happened to me. I was at a workshop. Actually, it was where I met Robert for the first time in Texas in 2007. And uh, a colleague of mine I'd known for years put her finger on my anterior scalene right here, and in that moment, clear as day, there was not just the memory, the way that you think about things, but an extremely vivid picture of 
a time I was about four years old uh, or so, that uh, there was a rope around my neck and I almost strangled. Now, I had nothing to do with this. This was totally something beyond my control. I managed to not do that through the survival instinct, let's say. Uh, the memories are still pretty dim, but it was so vivid in that moment. And she could feel it, and I, she could just feel that something in me changed. And I did not, I, I didn't have a startle response to it. It was just a very, very deep thing. Now, in the structural integration, uh, scenario, and that's why I have the little kid there, not because that was about my age when this happened, but I had a patient uh, that I was working on, and there's a, there's a point in the treatment where we do a lot of viscerocranial work, and part of that involves getting a glove, some lubrication, and working down the back of the sinus this way, okay? Now, I don't make anybody do that. Uh, if they don't want to do it, I don't try to persuade them to do it. That's just, in my mind, that's bad practice. However, I had one particular patient who said no. I'm, okay, fine, we won't do that. And then she came back a few weeks later for her follow-up, and that's a point where usually I ask them to come in with a list of things and how they've changed and what they want more of and what they feel is resolved. And she went through her list, like you would do with your repairman that you hired to fix things around your house. And she gets to the last thing on her list, and she says, oh yeah, the nose work. I go, yeah. And she says, I want to do that, because I realized I'm afraid of it, and I don't want to be afraid of it. And I thought, okay, this is cool. That's an excellent reason. That's, that's gutsy. That's gutsy. Um, so, not that session, but down the line, there was an appropriate place to fold it back in, where physiologically you would have the good response that you wanted. And uh, it was a pretty big moment for her. Uh, and she, she left in a good place, but a very different place. Uh, and I should mention, she was 62 and a retired psychologist. 24 hours later, I got an email from her that said, I just had to write and tell you, but for the last day, I have been completely in the present moment. I haven't been worrying about the future. I haven't been dwelling on the past. That chitter-chatter, busy, monkey mind, whatever you want to call it, has been gone. What did you do to me? <laughs> and I have to say, well, I can't answer that authoritatively, but I'm glad it had a good effect. And it, it profoundly changed her in a way beyond what you might have expected merely from what we did physically. So this is what I mean about using the body to affect the brain. So I want to explore some potential ideas. This has been an interest of mine for many, many years. So I want to kind of take you along the path that I've been uh, working and where it's kind of ended me up at the moment. So, uh, you might notice uh, when you talk to your patients and you take their medical history and you ask them to go back that they express a certain type of body language. Uh, likewise, you may notice that body language may change as your patient's outcomes improve and they start talking about the things that they enjoy doing more or the things they're going to do. There's a very, very well-studied phenomenon that when you ask people to be reflective or think about the past, their body language tends to become more inwardly focused. They tend to forward flex and they kind of go back into themselves as in their brain they go back into the past. However, if you get them excited about the future, if you start thinking now about all the cool stuff that happened these last few days, and what you're going to do when you get home, and the new friends you made, and how you're going to stay in contact with them, the general body language when one thinks about the future is to be more forward. This is pretty true. Watch this when you get back to your practices and see if it's not true. So this is an example of embodied cognition and the idea is that our conceptual system is much more driven by the fundamental physical properties of our body than a brain-down kind of scenario. And uh, there's several very excellent books about this by this gentleman. A classic example 
is the way we talk about our bodies, uh, the way we talk about the way we feel about things, like the way I was feeling last week when I was getting this talk ready, which was in over my head. So we use a lot of metaphors in how we talk about our life experiences that really are body-based, less than mental processing-based. Now this, uh, he also, by the way, for you math people, uh, he wrote a book applying this embodied cognition concept to mathematics. So if you like mathematics and want to see what the mathematical relationships are to uh, this idea of the body and the brain, that's the book to get. It's very dense. It's very dense. Now this is a direct reversal from the Descartian dualism model. But I would like to put a good word in for Rene Descartes because he did pretty much create that division between what is matter and what is not matter, what we can tangibly examine and analyze and all the invisible stuff, so to speak. And uh, he gets a bad reputation a lot for creating this split between the mind and the body, but he did one very good thing. Uh, being that he was at least on record as being a very good Catholic, um, and there's some debate as to whether he really was or not, but on paper, as we say, he was. Uh, the church wasn't too happy about science uh, back in the day. And uh, so what he did was he basically said, let us keep examining all of the matter, all of the material that we can get our hands on, and you take care of all that other stuff. And in many ways, he allowed science to evolve free from persecution. And we know that since that happened, that science and religion have gotten along great ever since. Now, paramecium, one of the simplest forms of life out there. It can swim, it can get food, it can reproduce, and it does all of these things without a neuron without a single synapse. It does it primarily... David, and yeah. it uses the same calcium-activated potassium channels to regulate its swimming. Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> I was hoping you would do something. Where's glutamate? I need to know where glutamate is in this. <laughs> that was great. Okay. Anything else you want to just jump in any time? So, and... It does this through mechanical exploration of its environment, mostly through its cilia, the little, the little fine uh, philopodia uh, on the edge of the thing, very much like our fibroblasts. It's the same basic mechanism. And the fibroblasts, we know, sense what's going on by the cilia that they're coated with on their membranes. And something else to think about, too, because this is one I don't see very often, Donald Ingber, who is the father, one of the fathers of tensegrity on the molecular level, did a lot of amazing experiments, and he basically proved that if you tug on the, on the connections between the cells and you alter the shape of the cell, you change its function. So on a very, very, very basic level, how you're shaped makes a difference in how you perform. And I think we all see that also on, excuse me, on the, ma on the macroscopic level as well as on the microscopic level. And uh, I recommend these papers. There's a good article in Scientific American that he did. But the basic takeaway from his experiments was that the more you stretch a cell, the happier it is. The more you let it round, it tends to go into apoptosis and die. I think we can take that as an object lesson. So. Helen Langevin did an interesting staining study about 12 years ago, and we had this idea that the fibroblasts are these nomadic wanderers going through this fascial web and going here and going there, depending on where they're tugged and where they're stimulated. But she actually showed in her staining experiments that the fibroblasts are also connected to each other in this web. So they have very, very, very long philopodia going from one to the next, to the next, to the next. So that model, she's suggesting in the middle, where their free-floating agents is wrong, and we should be thinking more about that model there. So this reminded me of the living cell matrix model of Jim Oshman. 
which is the same model on the cellular level, that we don't have these blobby cells that just move around and randomly bump into each other, but that all the cells in the body are connected to each other through the integrin network. So that when you touch, hypothetically speaking, when you make a manual intervention and you touch that in some level, we know that you are touching this whole tensegrity network within the body on a cellular level, not just on the gross mechanical level. And if you don't think things are that subtle, um, I have this one patient who sometimes, you know, you're working, you get distracted. And if I find my thoughts wandering off where I'm focused, I will do this. I will just like, you know, I, I, I just squeeze my eyes, like, you know, reset the brain. That's it, no head movement. I can have my hand on her in the lightest touch, and her eyes will be closed, and she'll say, you're making that face again, aren't you? So she can actually feel that change in tension from me doing this. But back to Jim Oshman. He's a fan of liquid crystals. And as he says, liquid crystalline arrangements are more the rule than the exception in living biological systems. Now let's be clear about what we don't mean when we say the word crystal. Because we say crystal and you think this. Right? Okay, this is not what we're talking about at all. What we're talking about is a liquid crystal molecular arrangements. So it refers to a much more ordered structure, okay? And it behaves both like a solid and like a liquid, like soap scum. Soap scum on your soap dish, that's a liquid crystal. Ooh, fascia kind of behaves like a solid and a liquid. Liquid crystal can also be subjected to forces, mechanical forces, electronic forces, fluid flow forces, and they can alter their function through that way. They're also sensitive to direction. So there was a uh, interesting paper from a few years ago where they took some collagen, they put it on a, a thin piece of glass, and very, very, very clearly saw its liquid crystalline regular arrangement in what they call a plywood or an overlapping formation. There's your regular collagen crystalline matrix. What you're seeing here is human fibroblasts that were put on the collagen and then what they observed under the electron microscope was the fibroblasts stuck out their filopodia and once they explored the terrain oriented themselves in parallel with the fibers of the collagen. So again in terms of manual therapies and being specific about the directions we're going to take in manual therapies um, I find this study also fascinating for that reason, not just this whole liquid crystalline molecular arrangement. So Jim also likes to talk about collagen being a semiconductor, and that's where he starts to lose me. Um, certainly liquid crystals are in your computer there, sir. They're used in a lot of different things. Uh, and semiconductors, of course, can regulate electric flows. They can store energy along with uh, an information. There is a university in Tel Aviv that two years ago started making semiconductors and computer chips out of milk, mucus, and blood. Now that is fantastic in terms of uh, biodegradable waste. Uh, all these computers that get thrown out, if we can start actually making computers out of organic substances, that's going to be good for the environment. Now, I did talk to the people uh, at the university about this. They were using a bovine serum of some kind or another. Uh, there wasn't really anything, anything collagen-based. The milk proteins are very robust, and they were using that kind of as a substrate for the chips. But I really couldn't find out any information that was collagen-specific. So mm, I'm not so certain about any of this, but I find it interesting and I'm going to stay on top of it because who knows what else we're going to find. Now let's go back to Tom Finley's friend who's also somebody that uh, I admire quite highly as being really, really smart and ahead of his time. But here's another quote. When you deal with the fascia, you deal and do business with the branch offices of the brain. What did he mean by that? Uh, this is a question I have in my head, obviously, uh, all the time. Well, I have some ideas, and we're going to talk about uh, 
a class of cell that gained a lot of notoriety in 2004 known as the glial cells. Now, the glial cells were found in 2004 to communicate, and they communicated via calcium waves. So it was thought that the activity in the brain was solely electrical, not true. Uh, this article, for those of you taking notes, is by R. Douglas Fields, F-I-E-L-D-S, <laughs> if you're looking that up, very easy to find. And uh, what are some of the things that uh, we know about glia? Well, they're often referred to as the connective tissue of the brain, which was why they've been ignored for almost 100 years, because how could they be important? When they discovered the neurons, the neurons were kind of big and sexy and oh yeah, but the glia tended to outnumber the neurons more or less nine to one, and they were much, 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 much smaller. Uh, however, we shouldn't confuse the glia with fascia. And it's easy to do that sometimes because of the way the word connective tissue gets thrown around uh, for anything that connects something to something else. The glia actually arise from the ectoderm, not the mesoderm, except the microglia. These actually arise from the mesodermic layer and actually come out of the bone marrow during embryonic development. I don't know what this means yet, but it fascinates me that it comes from this other part of our development. Uh, they're primarily the immune system of the brain. There's about one microglia for every neuron, and they are the infection in disease fighters in the brain. Also, if they get out of control, they can really damage the brain because the substances they use to repair in the wrong amounts can, can also not have a good effect. So they're looking into possibilities with microglia and Parkinson's. There's all kinds of interesting potential applications there. The other glia that I want to make mention of is the Schwann cell. Now, the Schwann cells have been shown, and I just got some citations this morning, to have a relationship with both the Golgi receptors and the Pacini receptors. So I'm wondering if there isn't some kind of communication mechanism going on between the body when we're working on it or when we're moving it. Uh, and the glia in the brain uh, in terms of it, through the swan shells as a mechanism, as a mediator between the mechanoreceptors and the rest of the body. This is also something that I just got this morning, which was in medical hypothesis, and there's another type of glia, the most abundant glia, is astroglia, and a hypothesis was put forth that the astroglia uh, are involved in the formation of muscle memory. I just got this this morning, and I was supposed to go on at 4 o'clock tonight, so I really haven't looked it over thoroughly. But uh, I did look over it enough over breakfast, and there's a chart in there that's full of biochemistry. And it basically makes a lot of analogous comparisons to the physiological roles of astroglia in memory and learning, and also comparing that to the synaptic models and looking for analogs between the two to make the case. But this is some pretty complex, dense information that's going to take a while to really, really understand. But there are people working on the idea that, uh, that the glia are involved in sensory motor experience. We know that the astroglia are also involved in breathing because they're very, very sensitive to pH changes. So when they get different pH changes, they will change the release of ATP to the neurons, which will have an effect on respiration. So they're doing much, 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 much more than we ever thought possible now that we can actually listen into their communications and understand how they talk. So in the classical model of the nervous system, it was a direct one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one connection, kind of like the old telephone system where you had to have wires everywhere. The glia work more like cell phones. So you don't have to have a direct connection from me to you up there. I just need to have your number and call you. There's no physical line involved. So, but it's happening chemically. The interesting thing physiologically about glia that as you go up the evolutionary ladder, the glia increase in number. On average, I've read a lot of different things, but on average, nine glia to every one neuron. Um, but as you go up the evolutionary, that we're at the top with that ratio. 
Uh, as you get to the bottom, the glia to neuron ratio is smaller. So the more complex the life form, the more complex the brain, the greater the number of glia there are to neurons. Why would that be? Now, because I'm in Ulm, I cannot be in Ulm presenting for the first time and not talk about this guy, right? So they actually studied Einstein's brain. It wasn't very ethical, but the man who did the autopsy for Einstein's brain um, kept it in a jar under his desk. It's a good thing eBay wasn't around then. Because <laughs> people would just come into his office and say, hey, can you give me a slice? Yeah, okay, what do you want? You know, and he would give them a cut of Einstein's brain and people could go study it so they could find out what made him so darn special anyway. Well, I, uh, I've read a lot of conflicting reports on some of those studies, uh, but the one thing that I was able to verify was that they took samples from two areas of his brain, both on the right and left hemispheres, and they examined them very, very closely. But by and large, none of the studies revealed anything remarkable about his brain. Uh, this one showed something different that was, on the surface, maybe not so surprising, but in light of what I've just shared, maybe it's kind of important. But he actually had less glia than average. So Einstein was no Einstein. And, no, he couldn't tie his shoes till he was eight or nine, so, you know. However, uh, and they compared it, by the way, to, they took 11 other brains uh, of adults about his age when he died, looked at the same brain areas and compared and contrasted. That was their control model for this one. One area back here, they found that in that area, his glia to neuron ratio was double the average. And this is the area, it was in the association cortex, most keenly associated with visualization. So, for example, being able to visualize problems, being able to, you know, it, it, it's involved with being able to visualize abstract concepts. This is R. Douglas Fields, he's the Einstein of glia right now. This is the quote of his that just really, really stunned me. When you see an egret take flight, soaring with grace, you are seeing what glia have helped vertebrates to accomplish, which is swiftness and grace of motion. Isn't this the kinds of things that we say when we talk about fascia? And he's saying it about the glial cells in the brain. Where do we go from here? How do you even get started exploring any of this? This is my friend Neely. We met at the university and we would go into the cadaver labs after the students were done and do fascial dissections when no one was looking and we became very good friends. That picture, she's not wearing curlers. Uh, this is a portable EEG device called an emotive. E-M-O-T-I-V. So it's a portable EEG device with a built-in gyroscope uh, and it comes with its own software so that you can actually use it in the field. EEG studies, if you've ever seen EEGs, they look like this beaded mask, uh, kind of pretty really, uh, and the control environment is, is very, very clean. These you can actually use in the field. Uh, Neely's been doing studies in yoga. Uh, most recently she finished one, not published yet, uh, where she was able to show quite clearly using standard measurement, uh, physiological measurement models for measuring stress responses, uh, happy responses, emotional responses in the brain, um, she was able to use those methods, teach this control group, I'm sorry, teach this group the specific yoga breathing techniques of Pantajali and showed that the breathing can quiet the mind when the mind is in an agitated state. So, you know, in her mind, she's, uh, she's shown something that we've known for 3,000 years that this is actually happening, but she's shown it with the EEG. So what we're going to do when I get back to Pittsburgh is we're gonna start, this is just gonna be like, you know, in the garage on weekends, uh, but we're gonna spend a little bit time calibrating and figuring out how we wanna use the EEG, and then we're actually going to use it with volunteer patients 
while I'm doing the body work and she's taking the readings. And we're going to actually start to get some information about what's happening and what's firing in the brain when we're doing myofascial type releases. Now, I actually don't have any expectations for what this date is going to be, but it's going to be very, very interesting, I'm sure. And hopefully, two years from now, I'll be talking to you about the data and what we learned. Now, I do want to take a moment. This is my friend who's the research librarian at the university, uh, without whom I would be dead, because <laughs> she's very, very good at finding out what I need. And uh, there's my information. I have a blog site on fascial connections. A lot of you have been asking about video. That's on there too. My email address is at the bottom. Thank you very much.